Okay, so shall we start? Okay, so great. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Masia, and uh, very pleased, you know, you are here after many online interactions. So we physically met, and uh, uh, Professor Masia is uh, currently at the Heidelberg University in Germany. And uh, he got uh, a PhD from uh, uh, the Italian University, University of Padua. In Italian, it's Padua, uh, some years ago. And uh, specifically, he worked a lot in the uh, US at the MIT, um, but also in other universities like uh, um, NTU in Singapore from 2013 to 2018. Then he moved to Germany, where he currently is uh, um, at the Harvard University. He published extensively in his area, and uh, specifically his area is on uh, uh, robotics and uh, topics related to robotics, as the one you know, he will present today on soft robotics. And uh, he received many words from uh, IEEE uh, conferences, important IEEE conferences, and uh, is also um, editor in chief, uh, associate editor of some uh, um, important journals. So, welcome, Professor Massi. Okay, good morning. I would like to thank the organizer of the conference for uh, having invited me and uh, talking about uh, the research that my team and me do in Heidelberg University. I know that the topic uh, is quite different from, uh, let's say, the main topic of the conference. However, we have, you know, some intersection for what concerns, for example, the use of machine learning and part of control paradigm that I will try to illustrate right now in this, uh, in my speech. So let me start from the from the title that is the path from rigid to soft robotics, symbiotic control of wearable soft suits for human augmentation and assistance. For what you can understand, uh, I operate mostly on uh, wearable robotics, uh, a particular kind of wearable robotics that is not rigid robotics like exoskeleton, but are soft exoskeleton and then are called exosuits. The name of my laboratory in uh, Heidelberg is called Assistive Robotic and Interactive Exosuit Laboratory, Arius. It's also my zodiacal sign because I was born in April. And uh, we have quite a nice space in Heidelberg University. I hope to invite Giancarlo Cortino and eventually his team quite soon uh, when we have a lot of time. He's a very busy man, much busier than me. And uh, the team is quite a diverse team. I count more or less 10 people coming from several countries, many Italians, but I'm an, I'm an Italian abroad, and then of course I attract most of the Italians. However, uh, we have also quite a nice gender balance considering that it's a robotic team, because I'm mostly 50 50, let's say. What do we do in uh, our uh, uh, laboratory? Um, we have mostly one philosophy we design everything in house starting from the sensor, the actuators, uh, the wearable technology, we assemble them, we implement our control, and then we test them on the ground. Let me start from uh, an iconic picture from this guy. His name is Ralph Mosher. He was an engineer of General Electric that designed the first example of exoskeleton. This exoskeleton was thought to work uh, into an industrial environment and basically was supposed to increase uh, the human strength, the safety, the production uh, in terms of uh, intensiveness. And it was defined uh, like a symbiotic unit with the alacrity of man's information and control system coupled with the machine's power and ruggedness. You had a lot of power at the time, for sure. Big hydraulic actuators, uh, electromechanical actuated as well, however, it was not symbiotic at all. It was missing all the concepts related to human-machine interaction. However, it was 
an inspiration for the next generation of engineers that wanted to test themselves on the ground of wearable robotics. When you consider wearable robotics today, there has been a, a paradigm shift between uh, rigid robotics uh, into soft robotics. It's not that one excludes the others, however, there are specific things uh, that a rigid robot can do because it's uh, much more powerful and most of the weight is basically loaded uh, on the structure and not on the biomechanics of the person that is wearing. But soft robotics is faster, it can match mostly the human bandwidth, it cannot deliver a full assistance, it can deliver the proportion of the human strength, but it's much faster. So these two entities are, ba are basically the same animals from the same species, uh, but they occupy different niches in the food chain okay, of robotics. I will illustrate how we control this kind of system, what are our ideas, uh, and how basically they work also when they are worn by a human being. Now, what is an exosuit? Just to summarize, an exosuit is an exoskeleton that is soft. It's basically made by garment that are worn by the person. Obstacle. And uh, tendon that are routed inside electromechanical actuators, electric motors. The tendon are pulled and basically your limb are supported in motion. What is the difference between a soft exoskeleton or a rigid exoskeleton? That when you apply the force, you don't have rigid joints that makes your arm or your legs bent. But basically, this kind of assistance rely on the human biomechanics. Are your bones that sustains the weight, but there are artificial tendons that are usually made by steel wires that support the arm motion or the leg propulsion. This means that in parallel you have an additional torque or force that basically allows you to save 20%, 30% of your muscular uh, exercise, your muscular activity. Okay, this is the difference between rigid robotics and soft robotics. What is the main challenge in soft robotics? Because this is important. With rigid robotics, basically, the control implementation and algorithms that are used rely on classic robotics. Force control, position control, velocity control. But this kind of systems, uh, that they are full of highly nonlinear events, for example, you know, friction, station, uh, hysteresis of the cables inside, these are non-linearities that it's, they are hard to model. You have to implement specific control, you have to detect what is the interaction force between the person that is wearing the exosuit and the exosuit itself, and then you have to translate this interaction force into an assistance. Okay, so it's a, a matter of detection of what the human wants to do. Now, what kind of exosuit has been designed so far? The pioneer is from Harvard. The lab is called Biodesign Lab. Connor Walsh is the professor that is in charge. It was, I would say, the Deus Ex Machina of this kind of things. I know him very well. He's a colleague and friend of mine. Uh, they basically designed the first exosuit for a human assistance in walking. The program that was behind was a program from DART was military program. This person was supposed to march wearing an exosuit for about 14 miles uh, with a backpack of 45 kilograms and save up to 40% of the metabolic consumption. What does it mean saving 40% of metabolic consumption? You have to consume 40% of less of oxygen. How is it measured? You will see it later. You have a mask that measure how much is the flow of oxygen uh, that you are breathing. Uh, if with this kind of technology, of course, there's a support in walking, you will consume less oxygen. It never worked. 40% were by far something that was unreachable. However, you know, the performance were close. But the program was canceled uh, in terms of military application. And right now, this use of this exosuit uh, are basically relegated to wellness, uh, rehabilitation, and assistance of people that are not able to walk. 
So the slides that you see here is basically made on exosuits uh, that are for lower limb. Okay, I am clustering lower limb because lower limb requires certain kind of control that is very different from upper limb. Upper limb, respect to lower limb, has a main difference. Why lower limb, the action that you want to assist that is basically walking, for lower limb, what you want to, for upper limb, what you want to assist? Well, the human arm basically has a lot of degrees of freedom. If you want to assist walking, you know that the person needs to walk, but manipulation is something that is much wider. Okay, so the approach and control is slightly different and a bit more complex. We will go through in a few slides. So upper limb and lower limb, two different domains, yet the same kind of technology that are based on Textile hardness, these are the name that is uh, basically the suit is called hardness. And then inside this textile hardness is embedded uh, sensors and actuators. Uh, and now I'll tell you what kind of sensors and actuators you can embed. So in our laboratories, we basically design both upper limb and lower limb uh, exosuits. And uh, our system are based on uh, detection of motion from the human that is usually made by inertial measurement units, the one that we have in our cell phone. This detection of motion is then sent inside a controller that understands what the person wants to do. For example, for an upper limb, I want to compensate gravity if I am holding a weight. To know how my arm is oriented in the three-dimensional space, I need inertial measurement units. For lower limb, it's slightly different. I will show you all these examples uh, and just go a bit more into details. So what are the three pillars on which uh, uh, softwareable technology sustains itself? Uh, it's basically ergonomics, actuation and controls. Ergonomics is a science per se. It's mostly related on uh, statistics, psychology, mm, psychophysics, uh, computational biomechanics. Uh, I don't have any of this knowledge, to be honest. Uh, However, you know, I try to not to step over the economics when I tell what are our results. But it's something that is stepping in robotics, basically. But what concerns uh, actuation and control, uh, this will be the part of my presentation because uh, mainly the things in which uh, me and my team are specialized. So let's talk about actuation. So what is the inspiration for all the actuators? We want to mimic, uh, mimic uh, the skeletal muscles. That's However, still remain unmatched in terms of uh, power weight ratio. Our, our muscles, uh, or things that are developed by nature, overrun basically and overperform respect to any kind of actuation technology that we can basically design and we have designed so far. But you can basically drive the ankle or whatever joint uh, of uh, your body with uh, electromechanical motor that pull a tendon. These are called uh, electric motor tendon unit or tendon driven units. Then you can have pneumatic artificial muscles. There's an airline that inflates uh, this artificial muscle that contract basically because expand and create torque at the ankle. Then you have twisted string, uh, basically are two strings that are twisted by an electric motor and when you twist them, they contract. Uh, shape memory alloys, uh, that I would say is more science fiction. And then pneumatic interference actuators. This is a structure that once it's inflated, expand and allow the dorsiflexion of the ankle. What I use? Electromechanical motors. I extract all the control law from classic robotics. This is the way you do. And then you transfer into control of electromechanical actuation. Now, this was uh, the Harvard system that operates uh, in the biodesign lab. So they started the, 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 the biomechanics, then you have motors here, a tendon that is routed to the legs, uh, into the ankle, now you will see around it. You see this tendon that is pulling. So you have to detect the phase of motion at, at the point in which the foot needs to propel, you pull this cable and you put in parallel additional torque to the ankle. Okay? So, I don't know if you are familiar with control systems, but basically you have, in this case, inertial measurement unit that tells you how the leg is oriented, and then at that point, the motor fires and basically pulls the string. 
So it's detection of gate phases. There are also other actuators, uh, the one that I was showing you before. So inflatable system. This is a hand with some inflatable tubes. You inject air, the tubes basically expands and your hand grows. Okay. Now, I don't like pneumatic actuations uh, for one reason, because you need to have the compression stage. And uh, while the actuators are barely made by, are basically made made by silicon, so they are very lightweight, uh, but then you have the compression stage that is not lightweight at all. And there's also another problem, that are not easily controllable. You cannot have sensors embedded in, you need to measure other um, magnitude, for example, of the example, and try to control uh, the, a system that is basically almost unpredictable when you inflate it. So that's why I go with uh, this is uh, one of our examples. You see the actuation, this is an electric motor. Inside this globe, so you have uh, a system for detecting the motion of the hand. And then, as soon as you move, the system pulls the strings and amplify the velocity of the hand or the strength. You hear also the sound of the actuation. You can use machine learning also, but you have to integrate the machine learning, basically, detecting uh, the electromyography of the muscles. Electromyography is electrical signal that are generated from our muscles when you attempt to contract. If you use machine learning, you basically understand what kind of motion uh, you want to basically perform, and the system will, uh, these are the actuators, uh, so the strings are right from here, will, will assist uh, the grasping that you want to generate. The grasping is the motion of the hand. We use this kind of things in clinic. Uh, usually, the test that you run in clinics to understand if a person is recovering uh, from a spinal cord injury or stroke, this I think it was a spinal cord injury patient, is called box and block. It's a very simple test. You basically have a box and you have to take some blocks and see how many blocks you can put in this box within a certain amount of time. This is just physiotherapy, regular physiotherapy. With this kind of uh, assistive technology, you are able to train the person in a better way because they have the assistance. As soon as the person attempts to move, uh, but it's not that does not have enough force to move, uh, the system will assist, uh, will be able to grasp the tube and put it in the box. Now, if there's something that changed completely the clinical, uh, uh, let's say, scenario of the patients. No, I would say we are not talking about medicine, but of course provide more uh, motivation for the patient itself, himself or itself. This is uh, the way you have to drive through technology for assistance, okay? We are not basically acting directly on the brain or on the peripheral system that has been damaged in terms of spinal cord injury. However, you provide the person with additional motivation and assistance. Now, we study 3D printing, so we use 3D printing to design our own robot. Um, wearable exosuit has a problem that you have to tailor the suit like, you know, something nicely on the person that wants to wear. You cannot, if you have many patients, you cannot tailor many suits for many patients. But you can measure the anthropometrics of the patients and then send it into a 3D printing system and the 3D printing system will basically print out something that fits and is tailored to a patient, and then after that, uh, you make some sewing, of course. Uh, you have your globe, and then this globe can be worn, and eventually later connected directly to the actuation, like this, with mechanical clutches, okay? And then they can run this rehabilitation test. We improved our 3D printing, uh, uh, our systems uh, completely embedded uh, in a fore arm with actuations uh, is mostly created by additive manufacturing. Uh, that's very small sewing support uh, and effort, uh, so it's easier because unfortunately textile engineering is not something that is widely studied and also tailoring. However, my, my team is able to sew, basically. And uh, this kind of system works uh, in uh, three different modes. The first mode uh, is basically you have a button 
that you push and the system blows up, but there's no control. Another one is with an app on the phone, or basically shaking the hand and the system attempts to close. So check. It should be activated by me. So what do you have to do with, it, with this system? Uh, well, the thing is, uh, don't think that this kind of technology allows a person to write again. Of course not. But for this kind of person that they have this ability also of holding a glass, okay, for basically compensating for movement, because usually the arm that is impaired is used to compensate. So if you have a bottle, you hold the bottle, you try to hold the bottle and eventually you open with a good hand. This is basically what you are providing. No miracle, but compensation strategy that allows to overcome some obstacles that are created by the clinical condition. So this is uh, an example of uh, using the slope. The person was not able to hold, to hold any object. Now she's able to hold the object. But this is uh, vocally activated. I don't have, I don't know why it doesn't work. The sounds, but basically the person says close, open, does a speech recognition, very easy, very simple, not in sci-fi, I would say. And then you can run some tests and help the person in joining in a bit better way the rehabilitation uh, session. Now, let's talk about control. Let's go about, you know, a bit more into details of what we do, much more technically. So control is, uh, uh, you know, in software-able exosuit, it's quite tough, but to be honest, uh, uh, I believe that my team is one of the best team in this case. What do you have to do to run control on upper limb and lower limb? I told you before that there was a difference between the two. You have to understand what kind of a reference that you have to send to the controller and drive the motor. These things change completely between upper limb and lower limb. Let's start with uh, upper limb. So what is the reference and how you understand, uh, how you extract when a person attempts to move uh, and then assist this person by activating the electromechanical actuation? For upper limb system, basically you can operate without including biosignal in the loop. This means that I'm not extracting any muscular activity. I'm not including the electromyography but I am just only using inertial measurement units and force sensing. If I attempt to move, this minimal attempt to move communicates to the controller that I want to move, and basically the system compensates for the gravity, understanding how is the three-dimensional orientation of my arm inside the three-dimensional space. How does it work for upper limb, elbow, for example? So, Inertial measurement units and inertial measurement units, these two things here. Recognize how you move and then communicate the force that is measured by the force sensors attached to the tendon. Okay. Everything uh, is almost Wi-Fi, let's say. So the inertial measurement units are so small, completely Bluetooth, and they communicate with this controller that is embedded in this motor. Now you will see it better. So, all the control system is inside here, and this is the actual experience. See that it moves? So, the Bluetooth system communicates with this, understand what is the three dimensional orientation, then you assist the gravity. You can put an assistance for the gravity 9.81. If you put more, basically, it does not compensate on the gravity, but it compensates, basically, assist more, push. Now, one important thing that I didn't tell you is that when you wear this kind of things, uh, you have to run. Uh, So this uh, torque joint angle, so how, what kind of torque I need to communicate to the motor to sustain the arm, this is tailored on the biomechanics of the person. So you have to design a computational biomechanical model of the person that is based on uh, its anthropometry. How tall is this guy? What is the weight of the arm? You cannot just measure the weight of the arm, but there are table arm, anthropometric tables. That's why you are able to communicate or compensate gravity because you know the anthropometry of the person that is wearing the exosuit. Okay, but 
the, what, what I wanted to say is that this tensor is completely no biosignal in the loop. Now, there's a problem. When you don't have biosignal in the loop, you attempt to move, and then there's a small delay between the activation of the assistance and that happens after the motion of the arm. If you move slowly, you do not perceive the exosuit that intervenes with a slight delay. But if you move fast, uh, there's a difference uh, between your motion uh, and the assistance is something that is perceived and people don't like it. Okay, now the main question is how you can solve or tackle this kind of problems? Does anyone have an idea? close by, let's say it would be, you, sh you should have added a word, the number of typology of sensors. So you have to extract the motion before it is generated. How you do that? With electromyography, of course, unless you don't want to put implant in the brain. But if you apply for this kind of uh, ethical approval, I would probably go to pension before testing the system. I don't have the competence for neural engineering. This is not my field at all. No, you have to, let's say, start from the cause of motion. And uh, electromyography, so extraction of uh, electrical activity from the muscle, is something that can allow you to do that. Because when you think of moving, uh, the muscles uh, start contracting, uh, there's opening of this ion channels, uh, but the muscle itself uh, are mechanical system and they have a delay. Between the opening of the ion channels uh, and the contraction of the muscles, uh, there's an interlay of time that is called electromechanical delay. And it's usually about 60, between 60 and 150 milliseconds, depending if you have small muscle fiber or recruitment of large muscle fibers. The larger are the muscle fibers, 150 milliseconds. The smaller are 60 milliseconds. So you think of moving, your muscles start firing, and then you have 60 milliseconds before motion is generated and is perceived by you. Okay, now, putting by a signal in the loop in this kind of control is something that we have done for first when I was a social professor at the University of Twente. I had 10 months at the University of Twente and I spent these 10 months working basically as a social professor with my colleague, Massimo Sartori, that is a, a strong uh, computational biomechanics term. I would say it's probably the strongest right now. It's a young guy, quite brilliant. So what we wanted to do is just using the same sensors, uh, initial measurement unit and force sensor, but including uh, electromyography. And uh, not including electromyography, just understanding when the muscle is firing uh, and then activating the system by using uh, a particular technique that is called myoprocessing. A myoprocessor is uh, an additional block to the controller that integrates uh, electromyography with some functions uh, that model muscles, kinematics, muscles, dynamics. Once you model muscle kinematics and muscle dynamics, you send this model inside a biomechanical model that was the one that I was using before, that is tailored on the anthropometrics of the person, and then you communicate with the electromechanical control to basically move the arm. This technique basically is, uh, I, I'm not gonna go into details, uh, but you have different blocks. From the inertial measurement units, uh, you send uh, the configuration of the arm. The configuration of the arm is used to calculate some internal uh, parameters of the muscle that is called tension angle. Your muscles contract, but does not generate the same force. It depends, uh, for example, when you are here, it's not generating any more force because your muscle is almost contracted and the tendon is completely close to the muscle. So the muscle tendon unit kinematics is extracted from the initial measurement unit uh, and uh, the EMG is sent inside a function that is called activation dynamics. The amount of force that is generated uh, activate a certain amount of fibers, and these are sent inside muscle tendon dynamics. This is the model, for example, of a biceps. 
this model of advisors uh, communicate the force to the computational biomechanics that you have from the patients or the person that is wearing the exosuit, and then it sends back uh, into the electromechanical actuation. Okay, this is the way you do. It's called myoprocessing techniques. So how does it work? Unfortunately, there's no video, but I mean, I can tell you. These are the different muscles. Uh, at that time, we had, you know, several uh, electrodes. Now we use two electrodes. But once you understand what is the activation of the different muscles, uh, you generate uh, the torque at the elbow. You see newton meters online. Okay, and the person is able to move uh, much more in concert with the exosuit because the system uh, moves without delay. You attempt to generate emotion, the system, and you start together because the electrical signal arrives both to the muscles and to the controllers. And then you start together computing what is the assistance. So, look at here the difference between the electromyography that is extracted at the biceps when you basically move. So, with the exosuit, without the exosuit. With the exosuit, it's much flatter. Now, between the two controllers, who performs better? Well, of course, here you will tell me, second, the one with five signal in the loop. Yes. However, that's a trick. When you use uh, the myoprocessing, uh, you have to calibrate the system almost every day on uh, electrical activity, unless the person that is wearing the electrodes does go home and sleep with the electrodes. So every day is about 30 minutes of calibration with the microprocessing, with the four sensors uh, for the, the first controller that I gave you before. You just wear the exosuit and it works. So of course, you have to choose between the two. But who's really performed better? The exosuit only with four sensing uh, or the exosuit with biosignal in the loop with the microprocessing? So we tested them just allowing people to wear the exosuit and then not telling them what kind of controller they were experiencing for some task. And then we compare the performance. So you have dynamic art that is pure force control and myoprocessing control, but there's force control with uh, myoprocessing and EMG in the loop. What do you do to test uh, the performance of an exosuit? Well, you do what is called a stress test. You test the exosuit in a very accurate motion. If you succeed in moving without the exosuit perturbing your trajectory, is for example a different place. But if you want to really understand if this exosuit can be used in a high dynamic task, you run some tests that are very dynamic, throwing the ball or just having the person that is blindfolded and then perturbing the exosuit and see how it is stabilizing with the arm. So this is basically what you do. So if you want to check if it's really stable or in, let's say, compromise, we say robust. This person is blindfolded and then 1.2 kilogram is released and the person is perturbed with the exosuit that is operating with the two controllers. Now, what we can say is that uh, both the controllers, of course, are stable. And this is the first thing. Stability in a closed loop system is something that you want to test before starting. But let here see. So here, I don't know if it is response time. In terms of response, uh, the myoprocessing system responds much better. Significantly better respect uh, to the force controller. So here we have more or less, let's say, 370 milliseconds to respond to the perturbation, and the other one goes almost 300 milliseconds. But in terms of stabilization, and uh, in control system design, it's called settling time, that is the amount of time that you tend to become stable after the perturbation. The force control is much more stable. So basically, when I perturb the system, uh, the person starts oscillating, but then stops much faster with the force control instead of F, when it does not have EMG or electromyographic signal in the loop. Why? To be honest, uh, I don't know, but I'm speculating. Uh, it's the noise uh, in the signal of the electromyography. 
is a noisy signal, and basically when uh, you give an impulse to the system itself, uh, the noise is even higher, and the system needs more to stabilize, okay, in terms of electromechanical actuation. However, if you attempt to move the microprocessing system uh, works much better. So this line that you see here is the electromechanical delay. It's the physiological time that our muscles need to react to motions. With the microprocessing technique, uh, you basically are more or less on the time of the electromechanical delay. What does it mean? That when I attempt to move, the exosuit follows me, and I don't even understand, I don't even hear or feel basically that there's a delay. With the force control, you need to generate the motion and then the system will respond. But however, it's 150 milliseconds. So this means that if I move, the assistance will kick in at 150 milliseconds later. This is something that you perceive if you move very fast, but not if you move slow. Okay. Now, okay, so this is a, was an example of what kind of bandwidth that you can have with this kind of system. So this one was uh, 1.2 kilogram and the other one is 2 kilogram plus. These are bandwidth that with rigid uh, robotics you, you will never reach. Okay, you can do it only with soft robotics. Okay, we understand. However, I would say that which between the two I would prefer? Yes? Well, I would say, yeah, it, de it depends, but to be honest, for a practical application, also clinical application, I will prefer the force control. If you design well something with force control, uh, you can get rid of all the biosignal in the loop uh, and avoid stitching electrodes uh, to the skin of the person. Also because I sweat a lot, and the electrodes does not work on my skin after a while because, of course, it degrades the contact between the electrodes and the skin. Okay, so it's a time variance here. Now, this is uh, during the pandemic. So, in my, in my lab, uh, they have one hour of fresh air a day. And uh, that one was uh, like that. Okay, so we tested this kind of things also on spinal cord injury, only for and this is a person affected by C5, so cervical spine broken, car accident. From cervical spine 5 down, almost, uh, almost, uh, let's say, paralyzed. Without the control, doesn't move. But with the control, with the two IMU that detects the amount of motion, this guy basically can move. Now, functionally speaking, uh, it's not going to play baseball. But in terms of rehabilitation, you can motivate this person, okay? So, moving, attempting. Yet, I would say that this kind of system uh, is not basically innervating the muscles uh, in terms of contraction. So the muscles uh, are always trying to attempt to move and the system provides the assistance. You can measure if uh, there's a reduction in the muscular activity without the exosuit and with the exosuit. This is, uh, matrix that is called high density NG. It's not one electrode, but it's an array of electrodes on the biceps. And here you see that this uh, concentration of high contraction in the biceps is reduced when you use the exosuit. Now, this is important because people basically, what, does it, what they do, they can run longer therapeutic sessions, okay? And uh, they are highly more motivated. One thing anyway, that is important uh, is that when you use an exosuit, you do not innervate the muscles. You are assisting the muscles. But let's say that central nervous system is quite greedy. What does it mean? It means that if someone uh, pushes me, why should I attempt to move? Okay. So can we innervate also muscles uh, and attempt them to contract? We can use what is called functional electric stimulation. The functional electric stimulation uh, is a technique widely known uh, that consists in uh, an electrode that is not measuring the muscular activity.
ductility that is injecting current and promoting muscular contraction. The problem of functional electric stimulation is just one. First, you're getting current in your muscles, and most of people don't, don't like it. And second, when you inject current in your muscles, you don't have control of fibers recruitment. So this basically means that when I run functional electric stimulation and I want a person, for example, to lift the arm, this person will lift the arm like this because I am recruiting large muscle fibers and not small muscle fibers. It's not fantastic. Of course, innervating muscles with current allow to not incur in muscular atrophy. You know, Cristiano Ronaldo with these things, uh, with the six pack stuff that was wearing uh, always when he was on the bench. You know? And that one is muscle electric stimulation. So basically, promotes muscle growth, muscle contraction, make your muscle grow. It's, I mean, what not for therapeutic reason, that one. You can use this kind of things uh, in conjunction uh, with exosuit. In what way? Well, Basically, injecting less current, allowing the person to move, and providing the other attempt with the exosuit. So you are injecting less current because the other portion of movement is partialized with the exosuit. The person attempts to move, I understand how much is moving, I give two signals, one to the electrical stimulator and one to the electromechanical actuation, and the person moves. Okay, check. All right, so here with functional electric stimulation, a lot of current. Here with exosuit and functional electric stimulation. A minimum amount of current, a minimum amount of assistance, but yet you promote muscles contraction. Okay. Now, let me speed up a bit. I don't work mostly on clinical uh, application, I work also in industrial application. Easier, unfortunately, easier because clinical needs, I think, are more stringent. However, I work uh, with other companies that produce occupational exoskeleton. But the occupational exoskeleton are basically exoskeletons that are not actuated, they are spring-loaded, they are passive. What I do is just designing uh, small actuation units uh, that provides motion to other joints. For example, the elbow, while the shoulder are supported by the spring-loaded mechanism that are inside the things. Now, if you use this kind of thing, so you use, of course, uh, with force uh, controllers, not electric controllers. And uh, can we study if the system uh, is effective or not? Okay, I can tell you that in terms uh, of uh, electromyography, these things are effective. So you basically work less, okay? But the problem is that, as I told you before, the ergonomics is stepping inside the science uh, and it's saying, well, you have to demonstrate to me that these kind of things uh, are not uh, damaging the biomechanics of the human person. How do you measure if a, if a biomechanics uh, or a, a physiological motion is damaged? With what is called co-contraction index. Co-contraction index is uh, the measure that is providing how much you co-contract when you are moving. Uh, that of course a very natural physiological motion. But this is something that is done when you have, let's say, or when you are wearing something new. So you have to accommodate to the system that you are using. With and without the exosuit, basically, there's no statistical significance. And then you show these things to the economists and they will be happy. Now, let's go to lower limb and let me speed up a bit. Lower limb is a completely different approach. Lower limb wants to understand what is the gate detection phase. So the first things that we have done is designing the system with one motor that pulls and releases the two legs and use Nonlinear or adaptive oscillators. So, and oscillators that understand what is the motion of the legs, uh, synchronized with the initial measurement units. Uh, this is detection uh, of different things, of different gate phase. Uh, then she will increase the velocity. The system needs one step to resynchronize, and then basically the system is pulling the legs uh, and lifting like this and releasing the other one. Now, the problem is that if you do this in a lap, you are walking at a normal speed. You are walking on a treadmill. You will never reach any obstacle. You are going always straight. But if you do that in a overground or outdoor, basically, you make a U-turn, 
you change the speed, you follow a ramp, if you're in wrong, you step over something, and tell you what, how do you extract all these things? Well, you basically create the same algorithm that basically detection, detect the motion of the, of the person, but you include a machine learning layer that you train with the data of the person walking. Okay? And this machine learning layer basically, my computer sucks, sorry, I mean, this, this should be animation, but it's probably, it probably reached the peak of its life. So you insert everything inside that is extracted on the treadmill, you go into a predictor, and then after you inserted this, you just control the person and the acquisition. What's supposed to start now with you? You extract basically everything, you give to the machine learning layer, understand how it works, and then you go over ground. Let's go over ground. So this is over ground, going down a ramp. I mean, you don't see here if it works or not. How do you measure if it works or not? Metabolic consumption. Is the system uh, allowing you to measure less uh, oxygen uh, with or without the machine learning layer? So, no exosuit, exosuit, exosuit with machine learning. If you go at different speed uh, and if you are on a treadmill, there's no statistical significance with this machine learning and no machine learning. But if you go over ground, the machine learning layer allows you to save almost 10% of metabolic consumption, less oxygen, if you compare with a non-machine learning driven exosuit. Now, we tested also, we are doing, we are studying uh, things, uh, unfortunately here there's no sound, uh, because basically this is something based on vision. We have a camera here that detects the stairs, when these stairs allows to push more the assistance. And uh, here, I mean, this is an exosuit with two motors, basically, not one motor, so. but the camera detects the stairs or detects other kind of things, so. it's machine learning stuff. I mean, I'm not a machine learning guy, but these things are now open access, okay, open source. And depending uh, on the event detection, uh, kick in more assistance. We tested it on the Philosophenweg, that is a very nice walk that is uh, in Heidelberg University, and this nice walk is in, uh, you know, in a forest. If we test this kind of algorithm, we reach outdoor peak of 22.6% of reduction of metabolic consumption in some persons that were very capable of using this kind of technology also 30 plus of metabolic consumption. This is for two motors exosuit, one motor exosuit that you see. Now, just to finish, do you know what is this? The jet suit. The jet suit is not a jet pack. It's something that you wear completely and uh, you have trust us uh, and basically you can fly and maneuver. This guy is named Richard Browninger. He's an ex-Royal Navy. He's quite a tough guy. He just designed these things by his own. 140 kilometers per hour maximum speed, five minutes of autonomy, then after that you reach the maximum gallons, three gallons that you have inside the tank, you have to land. So a few years ago I was contacted by a person, this is more or less you experience 40 kilograms of dynamic, and this person is someone that wants to cross Australia by using this kind of things, in an interval of five minutes of jumping. Her name is Jenny Bewis. So she said, can you provide me some augmenting device to do that? Then I put together a team, I'm inside, but I isn't, that for those who ride motorbikes, it's just a fancy brand. I have Dynese got it for free. And uh, I inserted inside some kind of mechanism, relying only on the Dynese suit, so there's no extra suit or extra skeleton. It's everything embedded inside. I use an actuator, so that I designed myself that pull almost 200 kilograms, 70 kilograms active, 200 kilograms plus in holding. It basically overstretched the arm and does not the arm basically bend when you have this push of 40 kilograms, okay? I don't know where she's gonna jump, but to be honest, with Dainese, I'm almost finished to do my job. I would like to thank for my team. I mean, I work with several people. I mean, everything that you've seen is because of my team that is in the left, and then I have 
many other, several collaborators who like to advertise uh, another conference that we are running in Heidelberg in 2024 is IEEE Viro Conference, uh, and this is, uh, let's say, uh, one of the major conferences in biorobotics. We just got it this summer and will be in 2024 running Heidelberg. So I think I almost finished, uh, and just let me go to the last slide uh, with uh, the philosopher Greg. Uh, and Elika actually that is coming is my student of mine that he has also been here. That there is testing the system. You see, she has metabolic consumption and then here streaming data and collecting basically all the data that you need to run the test. Thank you very much. System, but also wearable computing, wearable system. So we also had a, a workshop mm. on uh, Homo Wells, our national project on uh, next generation wearable computing system. So it's a good match. Okay, it's a good match. Um, any questions? Please. Thank you for the very inspiring uh, talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we had discussed about machine learning. Do you have to train machine learning per each person, or do you have a model? You have to train. I mean, no, okay, so it depends uh, how you approach that. I, I can do this in a second. So, we usually we try to collect many person and then see if it's generalized across. But we do it with single people, if I do not Yeah, with single people. The best thing is we'll collect a lot of data, collect a lot of data, and then send it for training them, and see if you can generalize each single person. We did it, I think uh, if we did it with single people, it was working. So each person trained the network and then goes and goes back. But basically it's five minutes walking on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the data that you have to collect for training. Mm -hmm. well. And however, for what I do, basically machine learning, machine learning is a layer. It's not something from which I start to control everything. Uh, I rely on classic controls, classic control system design, and then I put machine learning on machine learning layers on top, just to understand event-based, uh, <coughs> modulate the assistance. Uh, but the main core is based uh, on a classic control algorithm. Um, how do you ensure safety? I think it doesn't work. Oh, yeah. How do I ensure safety, both from uh, hardware and software point of view? Okay, so in terms of hardware point of view, well, basically this kind of system never 
provide an assistance uh, that overcome the maximum voluntary contraction of both. So you can provide 30% maximum. And uh, they are not rigid exoskeleton uh, that basically provide a motion in one direction uh, and the motion uh, is basically generated by rigid links. They rely on your biomechanics. You need to include also the compliance of the system itself. Uh, you will never dislocate the shoulder, okay? In a person that is, of course, a healthy person. With clinical approach, you have to play, you know, pay much more attention. This is hardware side. On the software side, to be honest, there are limitations in terms of you can limit uh, the output torque, the bandwidth. Uh, you can basically say that when they overcome a certain amount of current, you just cut off. This is what you need. What is used usually? Or oh, you were referring in terms of communication. Communication is not an issue for us. I mean, that's the Bluetooth that honestly I'm cutting out because as some delay and I will come back to wire communication. But this is the major problem that we encounter. Yeah. Any other? Uh, what about the control techniques? Have you used just the feed the controller or something more? What kind of control do I use? Yeah. In uh, human machine interaction, uh, the approach are basically two impedance control or admittance control. Um, I had the chance to study with the person that basically pro for, uh, formalized this kind of approach. It was at Neville Hall, MIT. And, uh, these are the major control. They are basically PID controllers, uh, but they are based on a different, uh, let's say, identification of the input and the output. Impedance control, basically you understand the kinematic of the person, and then you give a force by the actuation. Okay, admittance control is the opposite. You detect the force at the interaction, then uh, you generate a velocity that is communicated uh, to, the, to the model. So once you control in torque with impedance control, and other times you control in velocity of position. These are the two main approaches that I use in uh, wearable robotics, uh, haptics, I would say, in general. Okay, so basically it was the same question, but I would like to understand from the software point of view, because the inference that the machine learning model should run in a, in a mm -hmm. soft robot. So to use also some um, high-level board like so what kind of, of what kind of uh, hardware I'm using? Yeah. All right. But but it's, I mean, it was the other um, uh, rather than the feed, the PID, the uh, Let's say the low level controller is usually run uh, by an Arduino. Okay. Really, an Arduino Mega. If you insert the machine learning layer and you have biosignal in the loop, you need a bit more capacity and uh, computational power. Then we really stuck on top. Uh, we have a, a, a you know a, a sort of plug-in system for an NVIDIA Jetson. The NVIDIA Jetson is basically running the machine learning learning machine learning algorithm and then communicate with the Arduino at the low level control for what concerns the communication with the models. That is done at the low level. So the, the top level is uh, an NVIDIA Jetson. Especially with this let's say machine learning vision also I mean, NVIDIA Jetson is basically is mostly for vision I would say. Okay, so just a very quick one, I got this, just a curiosity. Have you ever thought of, you know, there are some um, works around about cooperative uh, exosuits, in the sense that uh, you got a group of people uh, wearing, you know, some exosuits and they are doing some joint tasks. Mm -hmm. What about this, uh, whether or not you... you I'm, writing the, I'm writing the project on it, of okay. course, I mean, it's something okay. that is, uh, let's say, on the table. But of course, there should be a layer for communication, and vision probably is one of the most suitable. Yeah. That's okay. It. Thanks okay. for the advice. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. For